Volcanoes to hurricanes, epidemics to environmental destruction. We have borne witness to the terrible damage that nature can do. But in this episode of Desperate Hours, we slip the surly bonds of Earth to encounter disasters in the air. There have been accidents in the air ever since the time of the Wright brothers. Indeed, Orville Wright was pilot of the first ever flight that killed its passengers, or passenger one Thomas Selfridge back in 1908. Plane crashes have been a fact of life ever since. On this program, we recount some of the most noteworthy aviation disasters of the last century or so. When 298 people died after the Malaysia Airlines passenger jet crash landed in eastern Ukraine, it was not only a tragedy, but a mystery. On 17 July 2014, Malaysia Airlines Flight 17 was on its way from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur when it disappeared. At the time Flight 17 went off the radar, it was traveling over a disputed border between Russia and the Ukraine. A total of 283 passengers, including 80 children and 15 crew members, were on board. So what caused MH17 to crash? Malaysia's Prime Minister said there was no distress call before the plane went down. One plausible explanation, and the one most accepted in the West, was that Russian separatist rebels had fired a missile at the passenger plane. But why would they do that? The most credible explanation is that the separatist rebels mistook the passenger plane for another aircraft, specifically a Ukrainian one. There was no doubt in the mind of this eyewitness that flight MH17 was shot down. The Kremlin blames Ukrainian government forces for the tragedy, even as the Russians have been accused of supplying separatist rebels with the missile launchers in the first place. Flight MH370 is believed to have crashed in the southern Indian Ocean with no survivors. There were 239 people on board the plane this time. It was on its way from the Malaysian capital Kuala Lumpur to Beijing, China on Saturday, March the 8th, 2014, when it disappeared from civilian radar screens. Major Airlines confirmed that this flight, MH370, lost contact with Subang Air Traffic Control at 2.40 a.m. this morning. Investigators of the incident believe someone on board must have deliberately turned off the plane's communication systems and then diverted it west of its flight path. It was a few months before any wreckage from the plane was even found. Then it was only a flapper on, a segment of a wing that washed up on La Reunion, 
an island in the Indian Ocean. How can something so big go missing and for so long? Especially these days, in the era of satellite technology, Google Earth and online flight trackers. Well, it happens. In June 2009, for example, an Air France flight set off from Rio de Janeiro to Paris. The plane was a wide-bodied Airbus A330, the pride and joy of Air France. But on that fateful night, Flight 447 sent an automated problem report before it dropped off the radar. It just seemed to have disappeared, seemingly for good. But with 228 people on board, 216 of them passengers, you can be sure a search was instigated. Still, it was a search that went on for two years before they found all of the dead, most still strapped to their seats some 13,000 feet below the surface of the Atlantic. The aircraft's black boxes and flight recorder were also recovered from the ocean floor in the vicinity of the Cape Verde Islands, and they finally shed light on the mystery of the missing Airbus. It seemed that after Flight 447 had encountered some stormy weather, the sensors on the aeroplane that detected speed and altitude had iced over, rendering them useless. Flying blind in the dead of night, the pilots were apparently baffled by the false information they were receiving from their instruments. Conversations on the flight recorder tell another story. It seemed, for example, the captain had been awake all night with his girlfriend. When the plane stalled, an inexperienced co-pilot was at the controls. As a consequence of all these factors, the crew of Flight 447 ended up crashing a perfectly serviceable airplane into the ocean, killing all on board. When discussing aviation disasters, and especially following media coverage of one, a term you will hear many times over is the black box. But what does this actually mean? The so-called black box is actually two pieces of equipment, the flight data recorder and a cockpit voice recorder. The flight data recorder records an aeroplane's many different operating functions all at the same time, including things like altitude, airspeed and navigation. They also record numerous other functions of the plane, such as movement of individual wing flaps, the fuel gauge and autopilot function. The cockpit voice recorder records everything the crew says and any other sounds or noises audible within the cockpit. Of course, what is actually said can be revealing, but specialists can pick up on things like subtle or not so subtle changes in engine noise or emergency alerts. The black box or boxes are virtually indestructible. For one thing, the flight data recorders are wrapped in titanium or stainless steel and tested to ensure they can withstand over 3,000 Gs of impact, the flames from a jet fuel fire, you name it. In the case of a plane crash that occurs at sea, such as many of the disasters touched on so far, locating the black box becomes more difficult. For that reason, both recorders have a device fitted to them known as an underwater locator beacon. Activated as soon as it comes into contact with water, the ULB can send signals from as deep as 14,000 feet. Most of the time, what black boxes reveal are some kind of engineering or technical malfunction, or perhaps error of judgment. But the case of Flight 9525 was in a league all its own. In March of 2015, the aircraft, an Airbus A320-200, 
crashed into a mountainside in the French Alps, killing 144 passengers and six crew members. What was downright peculiar was the sharp descent which began one minute after routine contact with air traffic control. But then it was revealed that the co-pilot, one Andreas Lubitz, had taken control of the aircraft while the pilot was in the lavatory, locking him out of the cockpit. It became more and more apparent that Lubitz had deliberately caused the accident as a suicide bid, not caring about the hundreds of people he would be taking down with him. But the deadliest crash of all time, at least as this series goes to air, took place around 40 years ago. And what made it so unusual is that it didn't really happen in the air, but on the runway. March 27, 1977, the island of Tenerife, known best as the largest of the Canary Islands, a tropical paradise with a colorful colonial past. On the day of the accident, a bomb planted by some Canary Island separatists had exploded in a flower shop in Las Palmas Airport. The little airport suddenly found itself packed with diverted flights. The two Boeing 747s that would be at the center of the coming tragedy, one a Pan American flight, the other a KLM plane, actually sat side by side for a while, wingtips practically touching. Las Palmas began accepting traffic again at around 4 p.m. This, unfortunately, was also just about the same time that a heavy blanket of fog swept down from the hills covering the airport. The captain of the KLM jumbo jet was one Jakob van Zanten. That Sunday afternoon in Tenerife, Van Zanten was in a rush to return his passengers home to Amsterdam. This impatience seems the only explanation for his thinking that his flight had been cleared for takeoff by air traffic control. As the Pan American aircraft approached its turnoff in the thick fog, its crew spotted the landing lights of the KLM plane looming through the fog. After several seconds, it became obvious the Dutch plane was heading towards them. Meanwhile, Captain Van Zanten tried desperately to rotate and climb out before the Pan Am plane. But it was to no avail. The KLM flight collided with Pan Am just after liftoff, somehow climbing about 100 feet before losing control and crashing. The Pan Am aircraft burst into flames and broke up into several pieces. Delta. Go Ryan. A first mission. Terrible and undeniably tragic as these accidents are, there's a sense that none of them would have occurred if it wasn't for mankind and its eternal quest for speed and desire to master the forces of nature. Even in outer space, anyone who watched it live can never forget how on January 28, 1986, the NASA space shuttle caught ablaze and broke up, barely more than a minute after launch. It took with it the lives of seven people. When investigations revealed that the accident was preventable, it did a great deal to discourage the public's faith and interest in the aerospace industry. that confidence and curiosity was just beginning to make a comeback. And then in 2003, on its return to Earth, the space shuttle Columbia disintegrated, killing the seven astronauts on board. 
an investigation board found that it too had been an accident waiting to happen. Will space travel become the preserve of venture capitalists? And if so, what corners are they likely to cut? Only time will tell. The challenges of outer space are one thing. Staying safe below the ionosphere is another. Take the Indonesian Air Force. It is charged with patrolling and safeguarding an archipelago, a chain of 17,000 islands over a distance almost equivalent to flying from New York to London. Put like that, the margin for human error seems quite wide. Case in point, an Indonesian Air Force transport plane is scheduled for a routine flight. It's carrying military personnel and some of their families, including nine children. With one of its engines failing minutes after takeoff, the Lockheed C-130 Hercules fell out of the sky and plowed into a residential neighborhood in Medan, the third most populous city in Indonesia. The transport plane smashed into two houses and a hotel before bursting into flames. Not surprisingly, everyone on board, some 122 people, were killed along with another 17 residents. On December 6, 1997, in the middle of the afternoon, a large transport plane crashed into a residential area of Irkutsk in Siberia. When we say large transport plane, we mean it. At the time it was commissioned in the early 90s, the Antonov-124 four-engined aircraft was one of the biggest in the world. It scarcely seems credible, but at the time it crashed, it was taking off from an aircraft factory. The Antonov was leaving the Irkutsk aircraft production plant with two jet fighters in its hold. Yet, just seconds after takeoff, the Antonov's engines began to fail. Engines number one, two, and three all failed in quick succession. Engine number four lost power as well, and then recovered. But by then, it was too late. But the Antonov-124 crashed into a four-story apartment building anyway, destroying it and damaging several others. 50 people more are under debris, 27 people from this house and 23 people of crew. Uh, so the rescue work is going on. Irkutsk in Siberia is a chilly place by early December. Somehow, rescue teams had to contend with sub-zero temperatures as they struggled to put out the ensuing blaze and comb through the wreckage to find casualties and any survivors. Eventually, another 44 people were found dead. A commission of inquiry drawing on black box data and voice recorders came to the conclusion that the multiple engine failures were responsible for the crash, which is hardly surprising but it also revealed dirty dealings in the contract for delivery of the jet fighters, revealing payments to offshore bank accounts in Cyprus and so on. Monies that should have been spent on safety precautions.
finally in this episode of Desperate Hours, as we encounter fear in the air. If there is one aircraft that epitomized the golden age of air travel and symbolized the jet set, it was, of course, the Concorde. It was the most advanced passenger aircraft the world had ever seen. Only 20 Concords were ever built, with the first commercial flight in 1976. And the last, we'll get to that. The Concorde used afterburners to reach Mark II airspeed, which is around 2,140 kilometers per hour, twice the speed of today's commercial jet airliners. It had a distinctive drooping nose that would change angle on takeoff and landing. And yes, it could fly New York to London in under three hours. Travel on the Concorde was also the preserve of the few, those who we call today the 1%. The Duchess of York once expressed her preference for Concorde this way. I am able to take my children to school at 8.30 in the morning, drop them off, then take BA flight 001 to New York and get to New York at 9.30 a.m. que c'est unique et ça sera unique, ça restera unique. The Concorde is that it allows me to go back and forth almost monthly to Europe. But the dream came to an end at the beginning of the century in the most dramatic possible way. It was a little before four in the afternoon on the 25th of July 2000 when Air France Flight 4590 began rolling down the runway of Charles de Gaulle Airport outside Paris. It was, as always, with Concorde, a truly awesome display of elegance and power. But within two minutes of taking off, the plane had fallen to earth in a blaze, killing 113 people as it sliced through the airport hotel like a hot knife through butter. One of the plane's left-hand engines caught fire on takeoff and was consumed by a huge fireball. After it hit the ground, a thick black cloud of smoke was visible from miles away. Over the shoulder of uh, my interviewee was uh, the aircraft with a huge plume of, of uh, uh, fire and smoke from uh, the left-hand side, um, 20 to 30 feet long, definitely on fire and definitely in trouble. Fires from the crash burned for several hours. In the final tally, all 109 people on board the flight were killed and another four on the ground. So what went wrong? Well, in 2010, Continental Airlines and one of its mechanics were found by a French court to be guilty of manslaughter in the case of flight AF4590. According to investigators, a piece of metal which had fallen from a Continental plane caused the crash. The metal debris had shredded one of the Concorde's tires, which projected rubber into the fuel tanks and sparked the fatal fire. But it was the beginning of the end for Concorde, and that end came fast. It didn't help that the accident came only a day after British Airways disclosed that hairline cracks had been found in the wings of its entire Concorde fleet. Within two years of the crash of AF4590, all Concords were taken out of service. The Concorde was posed for the last time with passengers. J'ai l'impression de... Ce n'est pas vrai, c'est pas possible, vous voyez. We hope you are not frantically cancelling your next flight after watching this episode. 
It does give one to pause, but remember, with the number of planes that are in the air at any one time, the instance of crashes is actually very low. Many more people die in automobile accidents every year. Admittedly, with the difference, they don't usually die hundreds at a time. With that sobering thought, we say farewell and fly safely until the next installment of Desperate Hours. Thank you.